The cry from the streets of our nation have been heard all around the world, yet somehow our own government still can't hear it. From peaceful protesters and angry vandals to grieving families and confused communities, they all have one clear message. Enough is enough. The minority is the majority that suffers at the hand of America's biggest skeleton in her closet. We're proud to be an American, yet afraid to be black in America. We pledge allegiance to a flag in these divided states of America, claiming to be one nation under God. Claiming to be indivisible, claiming with the audacity that we do it with liberty and justice for all. Our enemy has no address, so we show up on the streets. Our enemy has no face to punch. So they damage property. How do you defeat an enemy with no dimensions? If the enemy was a written statement, I could erase it. If it were a criminal, I would arrest it. If it were just a problem, I would solve it. But this enemy causes the most damage, yet has no dimension. Who is our enemy? Is it a president? Is it the police? Is it a policy? Is, is it a procedure? Has it a face? Is it a race? Maybe it's not a person, place, or thing at all. Maybe our enemy is something far more frightening, far more scary, far more terrifying. Uh, I just want our, our panelists to, I'm going to start with Cedric, uh, to just say hello to our listening audience and uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do again. Again, huh? Yeah. All right. Cedric Dean, city councilman of Greenville, Texas, uh, place six, uh, married, have five children. Um, what I'm on this panel to do is answer these questions that uh, the pastor have uh, written up for us to answer. I want to be able to answer the, uh, answer the question from a person who is not uh, a Christian individual, and also not a member of any church. Uh, so I'll be answering these questions on behalf of black Americans uh, at large. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting perspective is because you, you, the, 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 the problem that we're facing is, is facing black America. Uh, it includes those who are churched and unchurched. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, it's really hard to, 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 I found that a lot of people are finding it hard to turn to the church when the church is offering something that does not soothe their anger, like forgiveness. And, you know, when you don't kill my brother, I don't want to forgive. <laughs> and I don't want to, I don't want to hear that. And so the, what the church has to offer sometimes does not feel good uh, to, the, to the struggling family. But I'm hoping we're going to get some good stuff from that today. Uh, Pastor Yost, uh, your yeah. turn. Uh, my name is Chris Yost, and I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here at Wesley United Methodist Church in Greenville, Texas. A huge thank you to the Bread House, Bethlehem Baptist, Pastor Johnson and I had a chance to meet three years ago, and I think the Lord had just kind of put on our hearts, we needed to get be in, in fellowship together more and more, and um, you know what, I, I'm here because like a lot of uh, folks that wear my skin, we don't know there's a problem until we do know there's a problem, and once we do, I'm here to, to represent and say, we see you. We don't know what to do either, but we're going to be in it together. We're going to walk together, and by the grace of our Lord, we're going to, we will come up with a, a way out. 
Uh, listen, we're not here. I don't think that we can cure all the racism in an hour that we're going to talk tonight. <laughs> no. But I do believe that we can have some healthy conversation. And uh, I think it would be foolish for us to have this type of conversation and not bring someone like Chris here uh, that can give us feedback. Amen. Also, uh, my pastor, man, come on, man. Talk to the people. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, I'm Pastor T.L. Mitchell uh, from Bonner Church Family out of Dallas, Texas. Uh, this Sunday will be my fifth year as the lead pastor. All right. Uh, <clears throat> was given the baton by my dad, Pastor James E. Mitchell, who uh, licensed uh, Pastor Micah Johnson uh, over how many years ago? Almost 20 now. Almost 20 years ago. And um, been preaching uh, since 2002. I was uh, over uh, music ministry for a while uh, and worship. Uh, and it led right into uh, things uh, help. I was helping more so uh, with uh, building uh, membership and building men and, and starting programs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, had no desire to preach nor pastor. And uh, lo and behold, uh, God changed it all. And uh, in 2002, <laughs> I preached my first sermon. And uh, 2015, I uh, was ordained as a pastor of, of the greatest church, of the greatest church on the planet, <laughs> or at least in Dallas, yeah, um, yeah. Bon Air Church family. And not only that, uh, married to uh, Kimberly uh, mm. Dorsett Mitchell. We have two uh, beautiful children. My son just got a full ride to Colorado State yeah. right. uh, playing football. My daughter is, uh, is a multi-talented individual uh, who uh, will be a sophomore uh, at Duncanville High School, but she's graduating uh, with an associate's degree because she's in the collegiate program. My wife is a That's counselor mm -hmm. uh, in Dallas Independent School District and works in the same area where our church and mm. in the same area in which I patrol as uh, law enforcement for over 24 years, retired, and I still do some private investigating and some dignitary protection uh, for, for some of our uh, billionaires in Dallas. Mm. And so I've, I'm still bivocational. Uh, but uh, my, my perspective is to, to give you the truth uh, behind uh, what law enforcement, uh, how they feel, how they think, and what's their ultimate goal. And uh, I don't think, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, I don't think no officer wakes up and say, I'm going to kill me somebody today. Right. They don't do that. Right. And so mm -hmm. I'm here not to defend officers, but to give you the truth about their mindset uh, when you're in, involved in the police encounter. Yeah. No, that's good, man. That's very, I think that it's important for us to know, and I said this all the time, there's good and bad everything. There's good and bad everybody. There's good and bad police officers. There's good and bad black folk. There's good and bad white folk. There's good and bad Asian folk. There's just good and bad everything. And uh, so let's, let's, di let's, let's dive right into let's the go. first let's question, man. Let's, let's right. get it. All right, so question number one. What is racism? Mm. Is racism a behavior or a spirit? What is racism? And I'm going to, actually, I'm going to let Cedric start out. He told me not to let him start. But, <laughs> he told me not to let him start, but I'm going to let, let's get right on it. Let, let's just dive head first. What is racism? Racism is power. Racism is the power to stop an individual, stop a group of people from doing a certain thing. So law enforcement, I'll use those, those guys for an example. They have the power to carry out a law that's supposed to be equal across the board. But they also, in terms, when they go above the law, they get held to a different standard. So for instance, if you have myself who killed Pastor, uh, Pastor here, then that's probable cause, and I'll be arrested either on the spot or whenever they catch me. So what are we seeing with racism that these guys are being able to get away with things that the average person is not being able to get away with? So racism for black people have been used for, on us for 400 years. So racism is Jim Crow, uh, black codes. Uh, racism is not being able to walk on, on the sidewalk, uh, not being able to go to certain schools, not being able to do anything, vote because you're black. And that's an institutionalized thing. So that's, that's racism. So I think people mixing racism up with being prejudiced. That's me liking this black shirt right here uh, versus that orange shirt there. So that's being prejudiced. So we get the words mixed up, what is racism and what's prejudice. Uh, spirit to me is being able to, however you feel 
or what you do on the inside, to me, that's who you really are. And it's carried out in a, in a, a body form. So it's carried out through us, and that's just of being race, I mean, being prejudiced. But if it's institutionalized, where it's an organized group that has been <clears throat> sanctioned by the U.S. government, been sanctioned by the state, then that's how they're allowed to carry out racism. Individually, you can be prejudiced, and you don't have no power. This guy here can be prejudiced right now, but you can't say he's racist because he can't come over here and do anything to me if he think he can. <laughs> so, so that's what it is to me. I think Chris can take you personally, man. I'm no, not okay. no. <laughs> My taking days are long gone. <laughs> Pastor Jones, what is, what is racism? Is it, is it a behavior? What? Is it a spirit? Is it neither? Um, you know, I, I think if we make racism just about spirit, then it's a cop-out. It means we're not accountable. Okay? So if we say racism is just a spiritual condition, which I think there's an element that is, but if we blame it on something else and it's not me, you see, racism is a taught behavior. Mm-hmm. Racism is the kind of thing that when I was turning 10 years old, I couldn't have my buddy come spend the night with the rest of my buddies. That's racism. So it is a behavior. It's not just the spirit. Now, at some point, it does become, oh, like a spirit of core. It becomes the spirit of a people. And that's, that's what the institutional racism takes hold and it takes root. So I, I don't want us to cop out on spiritualism um, now, is there evil? Absolutely. Does evil influence that? I think it stokes the fires, it fans the flames, right? But um, uh, racism's hard to spot as a white person, okay? And I want to tell you, uh, in a similar way that law enforcement doesn't wake up and say, hey, I'm going to go shoot somebody today, I, you know, and I can't even put a number on it because I can't speak for all white people. I can tell you never in my life have I woke up thinking, I'm a racist or that I have institutional racism on my side. Now, once you see it, you become aware of it, but it's not something you just know. You, you don't, yeah. But how, can I, can I yeah. Stick mm-hmm. on that? How, how is it hard to spot as a white individual if we can show you and you can see it written down exactly what it is? Racism, what you're talking about, racism is hard to spot as a white person. That's on an individual level. Mm-hmm. That's, 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 that's a white person saying, I'm not racist, I got a black friend, that's right. or so on. So if you, if you don't put racism in its proper terms, then you're going to get lost in the sauce like here, this guy here, just Chris just said, if he make it about, a, it's an individual person. That's the problem with the majority of white Americans. When you talk to them, they want to keep talking about, I didn't do this. So if you properly put racism in its place and use the correct definition of it, then you mm-hmm. can easily see what racism is. And I think, I think that's where uh, the dichotomy between uh, two cultures see racism. We see it as one, and they see it, and then may not see it, you, you know what I mean? So I think that's where the, the hinge comes upon it. Uh, you feel a certain way about it, he feels a certain way about it. And I think um, racism is, in my, in my uh, little old lifespan, I believe it's, it's bigger uh, than a bias. It's more petty than power. Uh, alcohol is a spirit. A spirit is a force or a driving force. Uh, but a behavior is a pattern. And so uh, if you have a pattern of, uh, of your bias, then it becomes a racism. Uh, without power, it's petty. I don't like you and don't even know you. I can't harm you. I don't even know where you live, but I have this bias. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's, it, it, I don't think it takes power to be a racist, but you have a valid point. I just think racism is a learned behavior, mm-hmm. but that is proven in a pattern of, of your, um, your ideologies and, and, you know, and carry it out. It's, it's an action or a feeling, a pattern, a uh, bias carried out. Okay, next thing we're saying. Yeah, I, I, yeah I, I think that we can, our definition of a thing can be determined by our experiences. And Chris so, took all of all our time. <laughs> he did. <laughs> said you took all Oh, he said, said, say it, say <laughs> it. No, yeah, I think, I think you define a thing based upon how you experience a thing. So what my experience with racism 
will contribute to my definition of it yes. versus his experience with it contributes to his definition. I know we're going to move on, but in, in terms of systematic racism, power is a key component. So I absolutely agree with you, Cedric. In terms of my personal experience of it, that's why I answered it that way. Sure. But there's a system of power, and yeah. we might get into that later. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, so here's the next question. How should the church minister to a George Floyd family? Mm-hmm. So I'm not specifically talking about George Floyd, but I'm talking about a family that, that went through just what he went through or his family went mm-hmm. through. How does the church minister to that? I'm going to start with, 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 with uh, Pastor Yost on this one. Oh, you know, uh, I think you have to call evil, evil. I think you have to go through and recognize that um, what we saw in Minneapolis, Minnesota was evil in flesh. Just as much as Jesus Christ is God incarnate, we saw evil incarnate in that moment. And I think the first thing we have to do is acknowledge that and let a family say, this is evil, this is wrong. Um, I think to say, I know how you feel is a lie. I don't know how you feel. I don't know how, I don't know how the, that baby girl who said, my daddy's going to change the world, I don't know what to say to her. Um, I always think about the book of Job, you know, they, they messed up because they, they did great being silent for a week and then they started talking, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know what to do except to be and then start acting redemptively with that family. Of course, as he said, we address the problem. We um, identify, you know, the, the situation, but to, to minister is to provide aid. And so I think... Um, to a a family. I I take the prime example as Amber Geiger. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. The same way uh, Bolton, John's brother, uh, was criticized for forgiving him. Uh, Amber Geiger, uh, you may get criticized for um, moving past, uh, you know, uh, what happened with uh, George Floyd. I mean, forgiveness is paramount. Because uh, bitterness hurts the one who carried it, carries it around. Mm-hmm. It's, like, it's like drinking your own poison. You know, uh, one small ounce of poison destroys the whole bottle. Mm-hmm. And so one little thing of bitterness will have you bitter for the rest of your life. And thanks be unto God, we, we, we have an advocate. We can take all our problems to someone and say, hey, I can't handle this. Help me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the, the painful thing is that, that's, Pastor, that sounds really good. Until it's my son, of course. It, it's it's, and I, I'm 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 just gonna be honest. I'm, I'm I'm a pastor, but I got daughters, and you know somebody killed my daughter. Mm. I'm just gonna be honest with y'all, and I'm I'm in my church right now, but it's it's gonna be real hard. You put some money on my on my books. Huh? Yeah, you got to put some money on my books. You know, <laughs> it's gonna be real hard for me to. The, the first thing I'm not gonna. It's gonna be hard for me to run to forgiveness. But, yeah. but, but since we're talking about forgiveness, and I'm going to say, I'm going to throw this part of the question to you. What does justice look like in a situation like that? Is there a such thing? Like, what does justice look like? What, what does police reform or change look like? Let's say, that, let's say that, that, that the George Floyd family comes and the government is willing to give them anything they want. What does justice look like? From my perspective, mm-hmm. no problem. Just, justice to me, if it was if I was in that same situation, and say that was my my son, I have three boys, all my all my girls. Justice to me would look like I I would let the um, I would let the courts go through their due process. And this is just me talking and being realistic. If my boy died the way this man here died, or if he died the way Eric Garner died, uh, guys being choked out and then nothing happened to him. So that's racism living once again. If my kid was to pass like this, I'm, a, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'll let the system see what the system going to do. And in a situation like this where it's probable cause and you see that this guy got murdered and he did get out, then he probably will have just 30 days left with his family. <laughs> <laughs> and then he'll be, they'll be going through the same situation I am. And then it'll be their job to see if justice will work. And I think forgiveness does not substitute repentance. 
Mm. Well, and it doesn't escape a person from accountability either. Right. So the, the big problem with the system we have is, is there's different standards of accountability. Mm. Okay? Mm. And if we can go through and have justice for all, as your intro right. talked right. about, then we have justice. But what we see that has happened until we've got it on video yeah. now is it's been just us. We've assumed that, well, the white, the white police officer didn't mean to hurt anybody. Right. Well, we didn't say the same thing for the kid who was running because they're scared of the police. Right. You, right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think for, we keep saying, you know, forgiveness is the way we minister to the George Floyd family. Forgiveness is for the person who's been offended. Yeah. It ain't for the it ain't for the uh, the yeah. person that did the offending. Right. It's the it's the one who's been hurt. Yeah. So forgiveness helps us. You know, so uh, that, that accountability and what's going on uh, in their mind that caused the pain, you know, forgiveness it heal, heals our wounds. So I'm, I'm not saying just forgive them and, and don't have your justice, yeah. but at, at, at some point we have to say, okay, is, is it going to be an eye for an eye? Is it going to be a son for a son, oh, a daughter? Yeah. I mean, or, or if somebody, my, in my neighborhood, 20 cars got broken into in one night. And we rewound the tape. We saw the suspects. I don't feel no better because they caught them. I don't feel no better because they, <laughs> they're going to do time. Right. That don't help me because they got justice for breaking in that car. Yeah. What will help me if I go to God and say, take this pain from me, and, mm -hmm. then, and then I can move on. Mm -hmm. I can get me another car. I can get me another radio. I can get another right. window. You know, the pain is going to reside in the person that's been offended, in my own humble opinion. Yeah. Now, what, what, does police, what, does, what does police reform look like? If we need to fix our police departments, what does that look like? Wow, that's a lot. And, and, and mm -hmm. um, we're doing this too. Uh, we're selling some t-shirts at our church and a portion of the proceeds going to police reform. Mm -hmm. Our police reform is the money we're gonna gain uh, from the, the extra dollars that go, we're gonna provide food to that local police station that's in our backyard. Mm -hmm. All those who have problems with officers, or we're gonna sit down and have a forum with the police chief, mm -hmm. and we're going to talk about, hey, don't write me a ticket on my way to church. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> right. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Right. Hey, yeah. if, you, yeah. if, if, if you know me, then yeah. you know I'm in this community. Right. But if you don't know me, you live in Greenville, you police in Dallas, and you're going back to your city, and you don't care about us, and then yeah. we don't care about you. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. until you have some community policing, I know you, when I pull yeah. you over, hey, doctor, hey, right. Chris, pastor, yeah. slow it down. That's right. You know, yeah. Hey, yeah. hey, councilman. How you doing today, you know? Yeah. Lunch on me tomorrow, <laughs> stuff like that, or I got your lunch. Yeah. All that kind of stuff will go, you know, will help police reform, but it starts with, with that golden rule, doing sure. unto others as you would have them do unto you. All right, mm -hmm. Let, next question. Um, and I'm, I'm, Pastor, I'm gonna start, kick this okay. one off to you. How do we survive police encounters? Whoa. I'm glad you asked that. We just did a... Um, I know. That's why yeah, I made that question. Right. I, just, I listened <laughs> to it. Hey, hey, uh, they, we did this at my church, How to Survive Police Encounters, and I wow. did it with just right. four regular guys who are my friends. We came up with the four R's. I need to put... Hey, if y'all steal this, I'm going to know something. <laughs> hey, you can use this, but y'all better give me the credit. I'm stealing it. All right. I'll right. tell you right give now. Me the credit. Pastor Drew, I'm stealing it. Give me the credit. That's right. Hey, and I don't even have no mask. I'm feeling real happy. <laughs> the worst thing you can do is give a preacher a microphone. The four R's, a hey, blue, of policing. Everybody, if George, if, if what's his name, Brooks, mm -hmm. in, in, in Atlanta, is his last name Brooks? The guy, the guy shot in the back by the taser. Rashad Brooks? Brooks, yes, right. Listen, if Brooks would have seen this tape, we were trying to save our sons. Here are four R's. Listen to me good. The first R is respect. Respect. The second R is restraint. Restraint. And the third R is return. And the fourth R is report. Mm, okay. Give the officer respect. Restrain, even though he's putting you or belittling, belittling you. Um, return home and then report. If you don't show restraint and you're going to get back and forth, you might not return. But you got to show some restraint. And here's the, the good part about restraint. A lion has more power than the tamer in the circus. But he right. shows restraint to allow the show to go on. Let the show go on. But when I get home, I'm going to report you. And that's what you got to do. Yeah. But that would, be, that, that, that would need to be something that's done with guys in the community. Yes. Because most of the guys in the community, especially here in Greenville, these guys are seeking respect. 
looking for respect. So one thing that they're getting when you get stopped by an officer, they get disrespect. Yeah, and that goes both ways. Yeah, it goes both ways, but it's, it's a little hard to humble yourself when you may be young or you may be a grown man and a guy is doing a certain thing just because he's using power. So, yeah, yeah that restraint is easier said than done, but the training over and over, I agree with all the four R's that you said. Yeah. But yeah. that would be something that the community would need to work on. But I, I think we got to remember that the third one is return home, return. right? Return. That's listen, the goal. Listen, the goal, the goal, the goal is, to make, is to make it home, man. And if you know you're dealing with somebody that, that you know, listen, when I get pulled over, I, I mean, I hate to say it, but I know I'm a black man yeah, <laughs> pulled over. But I already got strikes against me the moment he come to my window. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to, to live to for tomorrow. Do whatever it takes to get home. You can because you can't get to the fourth R, which is report. Yeah. If you don't make you it through it, and it's sad, but it's that, that's the truth. So let me ask y'all this. Go ahead. Uh, uh, so this is this is critical because this is how we see. One of my clergy colleagues, African American gentleman, had gone through and told us, "Hey, my son got his driver's license." Well, guess what? I'm like, "Hey, that's great. Congratulations, all that." He goes, "You don't understand." You see, when my kid gets my driver's get a, gets a driver's license, it's not just congratulations. We'll you know clear the sidewalks, whatever little funnies. Yeah, it's what he goes, to do. we have to train our children and how to get pulled over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That blew me away. Yeah. And so when you hear and, and I you know we've got great dear friend who's talked about you know when my baby boy starts driving, and now I see that that's my theme over and over that I want to offer is. Once we see, we yeah. see you, yes. okay? Man, I, I don't know if you have enough time for this. Uh, when you, when I, I can imagine, when we do get our license, I, I just went over this with my son. He's, he's 6'3", 280, going to Colorado. Uh, uh, Playing football, right? White Town. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, and I'm Brilliant telling him, future. when you go jogging, make sure you stay on campus. Mm -hmm. When you get your license, make sure you hand on 10 and 2, stay out the window. We have to do that. Uh, only because we've learned to adapt. This, this, the rules aren't fair. Mm -hmm. you know, so yeah. we adapted and adjusted, and I think officers have to do the same, man. You, it, it's in hiring and it's in training. Uh, and when I say training, it's beyond the police academy. It's what they learn uh, riding with senior and veteran officers. Uh, a lot of them are ex-pro football players. You won't have a problem out of those. Uh, but man, I, do you really want to hear it? They're hiring ex-military. And, and Dallas right now, if you have two years military, no college, you can be an officer. Now, most of our problem children, if you couldn't go to college, if you had bad behavior, what happened? You go into the military. Okay. So now you come out of the military, you're a trained killer, you follow orders, and, you're gonna, and you want your check. Well, it's an authoritarian model, too. Yes, now, in the yes. military, you know, Cedric and I are both veterans, and, and yeah. we talked about that before we got on tonight. But in the military, it is do what I told you right. to. Right, right. That's it. Yeah. Well, when you're dealing with a citizen, you owe them the respect of why. What's happening? What right. are the conditions, right? It's not an authoritarian setup, then. I know, but then you get an officer where that power go to their head. Yeah. They never right, played there, sports, there. never been in the fight. Now I'm in control, you do what I say. Yeah. No, bro. Yeah. It don't work like that. That's that's Pastor Yost. Yes. That's Councilman Dean. Right, right, right. You know what right, I mean? Right. I've seen police officers, uh, a lady had on a Papa Do's uniform. Officers want to go to Papa Do's and get half off. <laughs> <laughs> or eat free. Right, yeah. But I'm gonna write yeah. the manager three tickets, tow her car, right. and send her child to, to CPS. Right. And you expect to walk in Papa Do's and not expect people to mess with your food. Man, let me ask you something, Pastor. You, you're an experienced police officer. When is deadly force necessary in a police encounter? Man. When is it necessary? You know, he Because we, we look at a lot of videos. He's messing with me. I'm the wrong officer to ask. <laughs> uh, uh, you know what? No, uh, this is actually a good question, Paulo. Well, when is it? Because we look at a lot of videos and, man, that wasn't necessary. That wasn't necessary. But, but as an officer, because I have to see it two ways. You want to get home to Kim. Yeah. And James and Jada. Yes. And, and so you don't know what the criminal might do. Right. But also the criminal or the person that's pulled over don't know what you might do. So when is it, when is it necessary? It's only necessary when deadly force is used against you. Uh, like they say, don't bring a, gun, a knife to a gunfight. 
But I think officers miss why we were hired. If you ask any rookie in the academy, they're going to say, I want to serve and protect my community. Mm -hmm. But you go from protecting to arresting, yeah. and the problem lies with the chiefs, wow. with the administration. Wow. Because I was labeled as a, you know, lazy bones don't do nothing because I was, I'm from Dallas, graduated Dallas High School, mm -hmm. uh, two years of a junior college, then I went to Midwestern State University, came back, church in the neighborhood, work in the neighborhood, so if I stop 10 people, I know all 10. Right. And if I arrest you, I, you at the mall, Pookie, why are you still in that T-shirt, man? <laughs> you know, so I'm going to have to barter with the guy that called. But deadly force is only used when deadly force is, 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 is brought up. But you got to ask yourself, how bad do you want to make this arrest? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I mean, I a can ticket I is just a ticket. Go ahead. I, I, I want to say, because I had a conversation with a friend of mine that brought up the point uh, with uh, Rashad Brooks uh, there in Atlanta, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, you know what? At the end of the day, they had his car, yep. they had his ID, and if he'd have run, he'd only run for so long, okay? He mm -hmm. was drunk. Yep. The guy was drunk. I mean, you know, I hadn't always been a pastor, so, you know, <laughs> and he made a stupid decision. Yeah. And instead of saying, well, you know what, we're going to get him later, sure. you went after him. Now, on the other hand, now, as a police officer, Okay, so if we start letting everybody go, does everybody run? I, and that's a that's a hard real yeah. quick. And I know I know, do? I know Brother Dean has something. Come on. The other Sunday, I pray, Lord, as the officers loosen their grip, don't let society tighten theirs. Right, yeah. right. You say that again, because, man. Say that because, again. You know, we don't want we want police to. I want to live in a safe neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. I try. And where I, try. I live, if you don't belong, they're gonna roll you. Get them. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? Not that, that, not that you don't belong. As if you're up to no I, good. I know. Right. You, I, I I live, you want to live somewhere safe. Yeah. Right. Do you or do you not? No, I do. You do. You really do. And and uh, it's just a matter of uh, man. What were we talking about? I, I, <laughs> well, I the, 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 what the, 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 the daily force. Oh, George Ford, daily yeah. force. <sighs> but you answered the question. I yeah. Asked Let me say this: <laughs> Out of 24 years retired, never had one fight. Never used my mace, never pepper balled anybody, never tased anyone. Mm -hmm. I wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> I really I did. Got, yeah, I can Because people in your face, you know, they want, they're talking about you. You know, when I get home, I'm going to kill your wife and don't let me find out where you live. Yeah. But I had to have restraint. You know what I mean? Because yeah. it's not about you. It's not about me and it's not yeah. that serious. Right. At the end of the day, hey man, I'm here to help you. Yeah. At the end of the day, they were there to help Brooks. And, 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 I own a taser, right, as an officer, so I know how far a taser can go. We're yeah. wrapping it up. And so I'm not going to chase you that close because the taser only go 14 feet, yeah. but my gun can go 50 yards. Right. Right. Yeah. So stay back, run, watch him, send the helicopter up. Yeah. But some of these guys who, who want to notch on their belt, and that's what I was saying, it starts yeah. with the, with the yeah. chiefs and the sergeants. You get a data boy because you wrote 10 tickets today. Yeah. Man. You get to do the next... Um, the red light grant. They get grants for writing tickets yeah. now. You do on the red light grant, you get wow. you, you get to work it next week. So that's overtime for you. You get wow. more money yeah. to write more tickets. And, and that's what I'm saying. Like on, from the council, we'll wrap it up and move on. But from the council, that's what I'm looking at is is law enforcement. Yeah. Even when they come to uh, to our council meetings, everything is about money. It is. I wow. think they're forgetting that their job is to protect and serve. If you need certain equipment to get something done, that just needs to be to do your job, not to keep allowing uh, people in the neighborhood to sell drugs for 25 years or 10 sure. years. You know the yeah. job. Handle, the, handle your business right then. So when you, when you take the money away, I think then you may concurve uh, some of the issues that's going on with trigger-happy law enforcement. I did law enforcement in the military. And so these guys do make wages, and they do. It's all about Everything's about money. Yeah, it's overtime. You get money for going to court. Mm -hmm. So I write you a ticket. I'm going to court. Yeah, you get paid for it. Because I'm getting my hours yeah. for going to court from my ticket. Right? Pastor yeah, Johnson, I'm getting in trouble. think about this. Remember when Jesus <laughs> said, you know, was, was a man made for the law or was the law made for man? Mm. Mm. Yeah. And, and yeah. this is where we're coming right back to what Jesus had to say about the law. The law is not there to force you. Yeah. The law is there to serve you. Should be, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we got it backwards. Now I'm finna, I'm I'm about to this next question is 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 it's gonna be a little it's gonna be a little uh <laughs> let me just ask it. How do we minister to the skeptic 
who argues the Bible is a white man's book written against black people. Hmm. Let me give you a verse. I want y'all to somebody get their Bible. You don't even have to. I know where <laughs> yeah. you're going. I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it because I know the slide is on there, but I want y'all, I want y'all to, I'm going to read this verse because mm-hmm. this is going to make this very interesting. <laughs> Exodus chapter 21, Most. verse 20 and 21. And it reads like this. It says, And if a man smite his servant or his maid with a rod, and he die under his hand, he shall be surely punished. Notwithstanding, if he continue a day or two, he shall not be punished, for he is his money. I'm going to read this for another, from another translation so it can make sense to you. Message version says like this. If a slave owner hits a slave, male or female, with a stick, and the slave dies on the spot, the slave must be avenged. But if the slave survives a day or two, he's not to be avenged. The slave is the owner's property. Mm, mm, mm. How do we minister to the skeptic who argues the Bible is a white man's book against black people? And they oftentimes will use this scripture to do that. I'm going to just let anybody go. I'm going to just sit back and listen to this. Well, how many go. minutes we got? Go for it, man. Just go for yeah, it. By the way, I'm not on an hour clock. If you're on an hour <laughs> clock, I got like to like midnight. Listen, I'm good. I, I tell don't. You, I'm going to okay. just cut it off when it's time. Because okay. Okay. Y'all, y'all go ahead. Because right. I know right. Dean going to have a long, a long <laughs> dissertation. <laughs> Mine's going to be short. I think Dean called no. me preach. He just don't know it yet. But I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 go ahead. I want to hear him because I'm, no, a, I'm, I'm just, apologetic. I'm just called the priest of black people to not stop taking stuff off white people. So, but. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll answer this in a minute, but I'm gonna let, All right. That's I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna let you pastors answer this. All right. You want to go first, fast? Well, I, 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 I can. Yeah. Although this is really a tricky one for the white guy to go, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, let me. I'll go. No, let's hey, go. I'll go. Okay, you go that's first. The, that's the reason Thank you're here. You. <laughs> Thank you. It's time for, it's time for y'all to be single now. I'm gonna right. sit back over here and be the eye candy. Okay. I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna say this, man. I'm gonna tell you. Um, my best friend was a Caucasian guy uh, from Germany, and he was a police officer. He died on uh, 75. He got rear-ended. And he and I would, would put people in situations to show prejudice. And so it, it, it hurts my feeling for people to not get past the skin. And, I, I, you know, as police officers, uh, just like the military, you, you, when your life is on the line together, just like a football team, you, you got a unity, right? But anyway, so I, I, you know what I'm saying? I just, I just wish we get past black and white. I'm sick of that, man. America is the only place where we're divided by a color. Black is not a nationality. It's not an it's origin. It's a construct. Right. I mean, come on. I know we took on black as the, as the uh, colloquialism, but uh, a cliche, but where is our origin? We didn't take on nothing. Well, they gave it to us. You was born with it. We accepted People it. People in power used it against you, so that's what we're dealing so with. Why are we it's not changing it? no time soon, so we're gonna deal with it. So it don't matter. Gonna, don't matter what, what you. Us. It don't matter if you like it or not. So we're gonna be what they call that's us. That's what you. That's what you're dealing with. Or so be what they call us. You'll be what draw bring us together. Black unifies us. That's what we. That's what we know. So it don't matter if you say African American. No matter if you say black. You know who you're talking to. When you say minority, then you ain't lost in the sauce. So, but we're dealing with mm-hmm. black because that's what we're. That's what. Laws, uh, laws was put in place and said black directly. It said African directly. So that's what we're going to deal with. What you don't like is not a reality right now. Well, see, I'm thinking my birth certificate said Negro. It don't Negro, still black. black. Still, that still mean black. Look it up. It's still the same thing. I understand. I understand. And in Spanish, is is Negro. It's still black. <laughs> I understand. And I'm, I'm still just saying, black I just, in Spanish. I'm, I'm just wondering, okay, can we ever get beyond the color? Not, you get beyond that when racism stops. You get beyond that when the people, the majority of white people in power make laws equal. You want, we want social justice. You want economic justice. We want racism in. So when that end, then we can talk all this non-black white stuff because justice should be blind. But until then, if as long as it's not blind, then we're going to deal with black and white. Because that's the laws are made against black people, and so we're not going to sugarcoat that. Right, right, right. Uh, and I'm we not, can't, and we can't get, we can't talk beyond that or I'm, try to go beyond it. Right. I'm not. I'm not. And I just threw that out there. I'm sorry. I know I, I went over. 
Here's my thing. Because if you're a Jamaican, you're a Jamaican. If you're Mexico, you're Mexican. If you're from uh, Australia, you're black Australian. Jamaicans, if black you're born Jamaicans in America, are getting done. you're black. Black Jamaicans getting treated the same way in Jamaica. Black, Jama they, black, Mexican, black people in black Mexico. I, I, no. It doesn't matter. Jamaicans relate to black people everywhere just like we do. Black people relate to black people no matter where you call them, what you call them from. It right. don't matter. It don't matter where. It don't matter where they at in the world. Black people are treated the same. This color here that they call black, you getting treated the same. So it don't matter if you calling a person Jamaican. You can call me American then. All right, then call me Brown American. This is what the laws are Why made against Brown American. It, it don't matter what you can't say. What you wanted to call it then? I just want to be you and call you Dean, my brother. Dean ain't getting Dean ain't the problem. <laughs> the problem is uh, the skin color we in. Right? It was. The laws was made against your skin color, I so that's that's that. stop. We deviating. We deviating why. Let me get on. We deviating why this Bible well, was used. Well, because he said uh, it's a white man's Bible, and then as you here's, let me get to it. I always say, why would they give us a Bible and they didn't want us to read in the first place? The same Bible they used to enslave us is the same Bible Dr. King used to help free us. The word is alive and living. It's, 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 it, goes, it goes far past a color. And I think um, it's not a white man's religion. And the reason that, it, the reason that the people say this, especially the people like myself who, pay, who may say, I don't call it a white man's Bible, right. but I do say the Bible was used against, to make black people feel a certain way and to keep you humble. It keep you in a it keep you in a uh, a situation so you will or will not retaliate against the person who's putting their foot on your neck. So we can't be silly and act like this Bible was not used against black people. We can't be crazy and act like ministers do not come to quiet black people down. These are realities that we deal with. So we need to just that's why you have some black people who are black nationalists or who are pro black or who don't who are spiritual or who do not. Uh, just go to church. That's why they say this is a white man's book is because you're not using the book to get yourself out of a situation like Nat Turner. Mm -hmm. You're doing, you're using it to more to be like, I guess he say Martin Luther King, but even Martin Luther King was waking up and that's why they shot Martin. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just think you can use any book to, 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 uh, you can. to, to, to do uh, harm or to, to have power over uh, different uh, races. Not right. something that's spiritual like this. This Ooh. is a different whole. This so what's is a, so special about this, this book? A, I ain't say special. <laughs> what's so special about this I, book? No, you didn't hear me say special. You what's, hear me what's say so a, spiritual you about You said a book that's so, spiritual. Well, you saying this book is using, different. You're, you're using this book to talk about a God that created everybody. Okay. Yet this same book is used for black people to be uh, belittled and to be underneath, to be Gentiles or get treated a certain kind of way. So this book is used and have been used over the over 400 years yeah, of slavery. They did. So and that's I why. So you. Ask, so the question is. That's the question. Why do people say it's a white man's book? Because no, no. it's been used against you. Anything that's used against you okay, is the yeah. reason you're gonna call it something. There you it's, go. His, it's his turn. He's saying, no. "Why do?" Uh, the question was, uh, "How do we minister to the skeptic who argues that the Bible is a white man's book against the black people?" So I'm the skeptic. Now you minister. You know to I'm me saying against black right. people. I don't. I just, I'm going to go ahead, Pastor. I'm, oh, I go it's, it's all, there's like a bunch of thoughts going through my head. The first ties into to, to the second part of it in terms of being a tool, okay? But in the first place, in um, U.S. Christianity, we've gone through and considered every lick of Scripture to be the word, logos, logos of God. Mm -hmm. And not every lick in my tradition is. There's some stuff in there that is not... We're, we get a bad teenager. How many bad teenagers have I taken out and stoned because they didn't listen to their parents? We, that's not the word of God. That was the rule back then, but that's not the capital W, as Martin Luther would have said, the capital W word of God. Okay. Now, within the scriptures, one may discover the capital W word of God, and that is a person named Jesus the Christ. Okay. That leads me to the second part. The, the Bible in that realm is morally neutral to a point, okay? Um, it, it's a, it's a, uh, in other words, people can manipulate it. We, as, as followers of Christ, would go through and think of the Bible, and it is, to me personally, a hyper-powerful book. 
But when it's been used as a tool of oppression, I can even understand that statement. Now, yeah. I wouldn't go through and judge the whole Bible based on exactly. that experience, but I can tell you, I, I actually can understand why someone would say that. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you. Hold, hold on, Pastor, before we got a comment on, online. Yeah. Uh, right. Go ahead. The verse isn't compelling. Oh, the it's, verse. Yes. Mm. Okay, okay. It's ignorant to interpret it that way. America didn't invent slavery, and the Bible isn't referring to American black slaves. Of course not. Of course not. You have something? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, uh, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, you can look at Philemon or Philemon, however you want to translate it, where the Apostle Paul is going yeah. through, and he's, he's imploring this guy to mm -hmm. go back to his go slave back. master. Mm -hmm. He said, so whatever you owe, that, you put it on my account. That's, yeah, that's exactly right. 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 And so what we have to understand is it was applied in, in, a, in a horrendous manner. Matter of fact, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, mm -hmm. thought American slavery was, a, was the scar of the human race. Yeah. Okay? <clears throat> but it was still used to justify slavery. Okay? Because, the, you know, even if they don't find it compelling being 3,000 years old or, or, you know, that was still cherry-picked as the reason for enslavement. Right. And I'm not saying that they didn't use the book to enslave. If you yeah. remember what I said, I said the same Bible they used to enslave us is the same Bible we used to free us. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes, they have, a lot of people take the scriptures out, out of, context. of context. And matter of fact, and, and I had this on our panel last night in our Bible study mm -hmm. saying that uh, the church has to take the lead in this uh, new thing that we're doing for as racism is concerned, and it starts with what you're doing today, is, is, is the fellowshipping with, with other churches, other beliefs, and not only that, we're divided doctrinally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the most segregated day of the week mm -hmm. until we can come with our Caucasian, Hispanic, Latino, Chinese, everybody brothers and, and worship the same God. Mm -hmm. Christianity is red. It ain't black or white. That's true. Mm -hmm. I, I think, I, think, well, I want to echo on this also that you cannot build an entire perspective of God and his word on one verse that you read. And because what will happen is you'll take the text out of context. Your dad, my, our pastor, <laughs> Father, just just to put it like this. He said, if you take the text out of context, all you have is the con. But the con. <laughs> yeah. And so oh, yeah. this text, in order to, and I say, I say this at my church all the time, so in order to com completely understand scripture, you have to read everything surrounding the text. The whole story, get the entire picture. But I, but my problem is, is that we as the church do a horrible job of ministering to this person, we, because we told them go read the Bible, and they go read this, and they find nothing in there for them. Right. I would not want to join Christianity after reading that verse, especially if I'm a black man. So you better be able to, as a church, explain to me why this does not fit what I think it means. And I, and I think that the, the, the real solution is with preachers and teachers and pastors who are able to rightly divide this to explain that Exodus is a book written by Moses right. who also, uh, who's, who, who, is an, who is, although he's a, a writer of the Bible, he's not the author of the Bible. Yeah. And there's a difference between the writer and the author. The writer just got the word inspired from God. But that don't necessarily mean that's what God said. So it means yeah. that's what he heard you, you, from what God said. But you also, it's, multi, it's still there's multiple levels to this question, even talking about why do we say it's a white man's book or why a lot of people say this, this Christianity that's supposed to be so blind have given us a white savior, that same savior that's been beating and uh, raping uh, black people. For all, ass, it, it ain't depends on who you ask. It's the image that's out there. That's, it's the image mm -hmm. that's out there. So that image that they put out there with this white Jesus, uh, that's another reason that you may have some brothers or uh, people who say this is a white man's book. I ain't seen, white, you I ain't seen a white Jesus since good times. <laughs> <laughs> and Florida was well, saying yes. <laughs> every, see, y'all joking around because every image, you know, even the, even the shows that come out, you ain't got, you don't have any, you don't have Hollywood making a black Jesus. So these are images that you portray that this person is supposed to look like. If we're going to talk about Jesus, if Hollywood even going to make, you use Hollywood because image is power. So if you're going to make a, a book or make a story about a Jesus, when Jesus come through, Jesus needs to just be a spirit that's operating in all the people that's feeling some type of way. Not no white dude coming through there being beaten, because when I see a white man being beaten and he got stuff on his back, whips on his back, and he's bleeding, I can show you a Negro that look the same way. Mm -hmm. I know that's so, right. That's so true. that's, the, that's, that's what true. we're talking about. So we're not 
I'm not gonna sit up here and sugarcoat uh, like we don't need that. It's not a black and white issue. It really is. It is. And it's multiple layers to why well, people say this is a white man's book. Even can though I say for the record, yeah. Jesus wasn't white. I, I was gonna Just say that's I was, I, 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 I was gonna say if you really okay. read it, it say his hair but was lamb's wool. Yeah, I ain't seen no white man with lamb's wool. It's easier. Yeah. It's easier said than done. Well, when you spread, I, when you have TV, and as you then we'll move on. When we have right. the image is power. I was a little kid who never wanted to go to work wow. because I was Come not willing to go. And, and because you're thinking it's just hungry little babies who with yeah. a fly on his nose flying yeah. around and some benevolent white person feeding them Man. and they doing this Stop. and I'm 29 or 40 something yeah. years old and that same little baby got the same fly and the same white person doing it. Wow. Until I was in the military and I went and I saw something different because I was in Egypt. Wow. So I did see that, heck, they got places that's way uh, more nicer than you have here in the United States, but those are not the images. So when you yeah. have the image of this white Jesus plastered all across the world, that image is power. So that's yeah. why you have brothers who be like, that's a white man's book. And if yeah. you're using it a certain sure. kind of way, then then yes, if it's not empowering black people, then it's not a book for us. And not even say, I'm not gonna say if it's not a book for us, but if it's a black man teaching that book, it needs to be empowering to black people and it needs to be something you can see. You said a mouthful, and I don't know if you realize what you said. That's, that's how this pattern of racism began. As a child, you at home All watching right. and seeing this. So as parents, we got to monitor what our kids see and what they do yeah. and what they watch and what we're teaching them. Right. So if I teach my child that Billy, the white guy in your class, is your brother, my neighbor is white. Her name is Mary Davis. Mm -hmm. Oh, sweetest lady I know. Yeah. Uh, my kids call her Aunt Mary, Uncle Mike. Yeah. To this day, James called her Aunt Mary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because when he was little, I said, that's your Aunt Mary. And they swam over her house. With, with her daughters and her kids yeah. because they were trained that way. And now when he sees all this is going on, that's where we see the, the revolt right now because the millennials weren't grown up in the stuff that we, right. we came through. Yeah. And, and this so is they're not going to stand for that. Let, let, me, say, uh, let okay. me interrupt y'all for a second. We had a comment on social media. You have a lot of comments on social media. <laughs> okay, oh, come on. We're going to have to stop and do some segments. If, when yeah. you finish, we yeah. can do it. Give me a couple. I didn't um, mean to stay this long. The first one, <laughs> the first one says, it's called bad theology, period. If you worship a historical white Jesus and taught by classical white theologians and use popular white biblical commentaries that have a white political social agenda, then you have bad understanding for both black and white people. Hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, the right. next yeah. one says, please, Mr. Policeman, do your homework on the issue or just stick to policing very well. <laughs> Who are they talking to? You're talking about me. What? <laughs> Say, man, not too much on my past. I'm too old. Hey, no, no, so no, much no, for no, no. right? Hey, no, what no, issue? We... Stick to the issue. What issue you talking about? She didn't say know. it. We don't know. We don't know what topic it was on. Well, apparently you got off topic. Okay. Oh, Pastor Chris, y'all. Oh, he know. <laughs> what? Yeah. What Tell issue? Not too much about. Man, we're not going to get all these questions out here, but that's good. That's good. I'm going to just. I'm, this has been good dialogue. Y'all been enjoying this so far? It's been <laughs> good stuff. Philip, you all ain't back there, man? I thought, I, I thought I've been giving y'all the real. That's the real. I'm serious from the hey, police. Man, I love that's, it. That's, oh, oh, they, oh, they want my police and they don't want my biblical perspective. <laughs> oh, so they want me to pick a side. I'm on Dean's no, side. I'm on you, his side. They don't want you to pick a side, but they want you to the same way you want to uh, tell your uh, son that this is your auntie. Uh, then what we've been saying is that that same white auntie who's just nice have also been this same white man who's supposed to save black people. So that's our issue. <laughs> but you, but you, but, but so they, his daddy is uh, our savior. <laughs> but see, but, I didn't teach uh, my son that. Yeah, but we, yeah, but, but we was grew up. We grew up like that. We had white I Jesus wasn't. everywhere, and I'm 44, and it, and it's still. So I'm telling you, this stuff is passed on generation to generation. You're right. It's not a. It's it, you where know it's it happening. Where do it stop? Right. That's the question. Where do it stop? Is where do we stop it at? You stop it in uh, every church need. If you talk about Jesus don't have no color, then take down all your Jesus we pictures. We ain't got one. I ain't saying you one church, so we're not talking about you, but you can still go to church. If Jesus don't have an image, just have a cross up. Right. Then that's what we need. Then well, that's but how I would goes. disagree, because I think if, if, I'm in Jap if I'm in Japan, I need to see a Japanese They Jesus have speak. one. Uh -huh. That's right. Yep. It, and, and, and it's not so much that... Uh, having an enculturated understanding of Jesus is bad, it's when it's the only Jesus that can exist. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah. And, and so it's funny because as you're talking, I, I have an image that a friend of mine had offered to me one time. He said, Chris, 
I don't want a gray soup of America. I want a tapestry where all of our colors show. That yeah. is what I think we're struggling for. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't hear people saying, hey, let's all be the same. You know what? Uh, I agree. Black is beautiful. Be black and be fully black. Uh, uh, German, that's what I mostly am, is beautiful. I should be that. You see, when we accepted the United States understanding of race, I sacrificed my identity at will. Mm -hmm. Other people were forced to sacrifice their sure. identity. All of us, though, have lost something. James H. Cohn was the one who went through and talked about how, in a, theory, in a theology of, uh, of uh, liberation, he talked about how this system kills all of us, hmm. but we don't see it when we benefit from it. Hmm. When we benefit hmm. from it, we're just on cruise control because there's gas just keeps going in the tank. But yeah. we see people on the side of the road and we know we should stop. We don't help them. We yeah. keep going and you kill part of yourself every time you do that. <laughs> so the tapestry is what I think God's calling us to. I said that in the opening comments, and it was theologically profound. <laughs> do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Yeah. You're not Somebody gonna, said that. That's I a said good that. Line. You're not going to stop on the side of the road. Who is thy neighbor? Jesus said. Mm -hmm. Right. A man was coming from Jericho, fell That's among right. thieves. Yeah, fell among thieves. Luke, and a Luke church man, 10. Levite, passed him passed by. Him up. Come on. All yeah. these priests passed him by. But until you've been on the side of the road, you're not going to put your hazards on to help somebody fix a flat Man, unless boy. you've been there before. And what Dean is saying, y'all don't know how it feels because you ain't been there. And I yeah. don't. But I'm trying to show Dean is uh, even though he hadn't been there, let's give him a chance uh, to, 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 to rectify yeah. or, or we, we have to move forward. Let's, let's go. Well, let's let me, go beyond. I'm just going to jump right into this one, this question here. How can white believers or white people mm -hmm. help black believers or black people in the struggle against racism. Mm -hmm. How can you help us? White people, my, my white friends will ask me, what do I do? How can I help? So how can they help? How can you help? I'm just, anybody start you, that. You, nobody's, nobody's asking uh, Chris or any other white person to feel what a black person feels, you, you, you're not, that's just impossible. We already sure, know that. That's sure. understood sure. water under right. the bridge. But you can be empathetic. You can do your homework on what black people are going through and realize that they have valid issues. Mm -hmm. And what you mm -hmm. can do as a white individual is be an ally on going about things how we need to go about it. Sure. Don't come into the room and tell us we need to go left or right when we're telling you we need to go straight to get our issues solved. So the only way a white person can help us uh, is to be an ally with us. But the majority of white people in the United States can help black individuals and in, uh, any other race across the board because the numbers are there. It's the majority white population in the United States, so when they come together, or when the majority of them decide, okay, we're going to change the laws, we're going to put these things on the book, then that's how they can help. Yeah. Use your numbers uh, because math makes sense. 40 million black people can go vote and not change absolutely nothing. We don't have the numbers. Uh, you guys are pretty much divided, so that's why things are like it is. So what you can do is see that uh, we have a claim, we have, a, uh, we have issues, justice haven't been served, need to be changed, and use your numbers to make sure it's written down on paper, it's in law, and carried out. Can, can I need to say one thing to, to our white folks that are watching that I had to learn along the way? We're not being asked to charge in like the cavalry and fix everything, right. okay? The, so what I've had to learn to do is to say, I see this and I don't know what to do, and then start a conversation, okay? Because what we want to do is, is we want to come in and we're going to fix this, and in two weeks, guess what, Cedric? Every wrong is righted. Now let's just move on with life. Yeah. And this is a journey. This is a, a step, step, step kind of thing. Okay? Yeah. I, I think, and it's real simple, is recognize what's wrong mm -hmm. and recognize the oppression. Um, recognize when somebody is, is talking against, the, against what we're trying to convey. And, you know, help us have a voice, you know what I mean? Um, that's all I'd say, help us have a voice because when you see uh, what happened to George Floyd and you say, well, what did he do? 
or let's wait till the autopsy come out, you automatically, you know, discounted him being a person that was choked to death by a knee and categorized him as something that happened. So help us say, yeah, that was wrong. We're not going to stand for that. I think yeah. something that simple. Yeah, I think that's, that's very important is that if I was to say, <laughs> I mean, I don't mean no disrespect, but to my white friends, if you want to know how you can help us, talk to your white friends. <laughs> Talk to them. We are not your problem. The problem is them. Have a conversation with them. The next time they do something that just simply doesn't make sense to you or that you think is completely wrong or stereotypical, whatever, address them. Because here's the deal. If you can't, I don't really think that, that white America can help black America without sacrificing a bit of their white privilege to do so. See, anybody can say, I want to help the black people. But let me know if you still mean that when it costs you some of the privileges that being white gave you. Right. Because in order to balance those scales, you've got to, you got to have to give me some stuff, and it, it's going to require you to give up some stuff as well. Well, I want to say something on that too, because what, I, what I've actually begun to learn, if, if we are helping justice for all, okay, if we're getting to a place of justice for all, Ironically, I don't get, I don't, I, I don't end up giving as much as everybody acts like, because because there's a prevalent fear among old white America. Okay, there's an old system that says everything is a scarce thing; it's a commodity. Okay, so if if you get something, I gotta lose it, and the the, the notion of the balance is a false thing. Mm -hmm. That is not biblical. Okay. God has more than we need. Wow. But what we have done is we've bought into a worldly system that is informed by economic policy, it's formed by uh, relationships. Think about kids going, do you love me more than mom, or do you love me more than this? Yeah. That's wrong. If we have agape, then there's more than enough. Now, carrying that forward, yes, there's going to have to be some economic give that happens to get people up. Absolutely. But in the big picture of things, this is not, people are afraid of losing instead of understanding scarcity is a construct. Uh, anyway, that's, I just realized I could keep going, but. <laughs> I'll probably answer. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm going to give you one last question, and this is my last one. I had several others, but I think we're going we're gonna to stop here because this, this has been, I mean, this has been some really good dialogue. I'm, this has came out, this came out way better than I expected for it to, and I'm so glad about that. I'm going to give you one last question, or statement rather. Explain Black Lives Matter versus mm. all lives matter. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'm just, anybody start there. You start. Me? Yeah. Oh. We're going to start, well, I, I don't want to start with you. Okay. Since you're getting lost in the color. I don't think I'm lost. I mean, hold yeah, on, man. I'm, I ain't going to tell y'all too many more times. Hey, man, listen, my, my listen, pastor, man. man. Hey, <laughs> I'm real as it gets, man. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. I, hey, man, I'm t this is real raw and uncut. Y'all just can't handle my rawness. <laughs> It's too watered down for you saying it's not. It's no, not that's water. the problem that's watered down. It's not watered down, man. It's too man. much cream in your coffee it right now. It is not, man. I'm your telling coffee, you. Man, I'm trying to tell you, man, this is, yeah. this is it. Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter. Um, I can't speak for the, the movement. The movement is saying all lives do matter, but they won't matter until black lives matter. That's what they're saying. I'm done. Oh, he moderating now. <laughs> you know what? Thank you. So it, it's uh, uh, the, the hard part is people think, again, it's that, that scarcity mentality. Well, if we just pay attention to black lives, what about me? Right? People fail to realize that when Jesus left the 99, he left them in a high place. Come on here. He left them in a safe place so that he could go rescue the, the one. one. Okay? Uh, when my youngest daughter needed my family's care and attention, and I asked for prayers for my youngest daughter, it wasn't to exclude my older two kids, right. but she was the one that needed the help, right. okay? And so when we go through, and, and, and I understand, I had a, a post, uh, you had posted, uh, and I shared it uh, on Facebook, and I was trying to convey to some of my Anglo friends and to let my, my black friends know, I see you. I see it, and I understand it, and we're trying real hard this is not saying that blue lives don't matter. This isn't saying that white lives or whoever's life doesn't matter. What it's saying is, it is my brother 
who died on the pavement in Minneapolis and he needed our help. And we have a system set up where people even tried to help and the system overrode their ability to help. So uh, my, 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 my brown brothers, my black brothers, my sisters are crying out for help and right now, that's, that's where we need to put our attention. So, so I love what you said, Pastor Tracy. That's the thing is, is it, all lives can't matter right now right. because the black life is taken for granted. Yeah, yeah. And before you go, Dean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I know you're going to have a final comment. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I'm all on board with, with Black Lives Matter. But man, we gotta stop robbing each other, man, and, and breaking in each other's cars and breaking it and doing all our own against each other too. I was we gotta about, matter I was to, about to say that. We gotta matter to each other too, man. Yeah. And we gotta take some accountability. Yeah. I know the system is against us. Uh, slavery had a, a big number on us, but at one point we gotta say I'm better than that. You know yeah. what I mean? Until mm -hmm. until I look at you as a brother, I I, I don't want to break in your car. Don't break in my car. I don't want to hurt you. Don't hurt yeah. me. I don't want to. You know, let's 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 start lifting each other up as we climb. Yeah. No, that's a fact, though. Black Lives Matter, to me, uh, is, is pretty much saying that we need to hold ourselves accountable first, yeah. first and foremost. But we're also fighting against a system yes. who, even though it matters to us and we need to change, yeah. the ones that have the power or, or that are, have been governed to protect and serve are abusing power. They are. So they're the ones who are not considering Black Lives Matter. So, but the Black Lives Matter to me, this is a simple, simple answer. Like I say, we're gonna go into nothing crazy, sure. but it is us holding each other accountable, coming together, doing what we need to do for ourselves, uh, setting a new standard, uh, setting a standard that most of our parents already have, except we pretty much deviated from it, setting some of the examples that the churches have that we have deviated from. We need to make sure we come back together, honor each other, uh, respect each other, so that when we do go out there, uh, and we're getting persecuted, or uh, racism is being used against us, we have a leg to stand on. Because all we do right now, when we do not uh, respect and honor each other, is we give the people in charge a reason to continue to carry out things, a reason to not uh, want to change the laws on the book. We talk about reparations. They say they can't give reparations, or they don't want to give reparations to 40 million people. But now you COVID happened, and the majority of the white businesses have been affected. Now they want to give money to a trillion, uh, 100, 100 million people, or yeah. uh, three times as that. So they can find, so the people in charge can find money when they want to find money. Uh, so Black Lives Matter, once again, I'm, I'm getting off topic before I go a little bit crazy. It's just us respecting each other, yeah. setting a new standard, uh, and that's, it. that's pretty much it. Yeah, I think it's hypocritical for us as black individuals to chant Black Lives Matter while we take black lives. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we, we can get all up in arms when they kill us, yeah. but when we kill us, oh, yeah. did you see what happened to Pookie? Yeah. I mean, really? I mean, ain't nobody chanting in. Ain't nobody yeah. marching and protesting when, it's, it's, when it's, the Crips can, is killing the bloods. I mean, well, come on, man, we gotta do better than that. Yeah, we, can, we, have to, we have to do better, but at the same time, we're still not, I didn't, uh, I didn't go down to the courthouse, I didn't go to the police academy and to swear and protect and serve. I didn't do that. Sure. So there is a difference between us doing something to each other because we do right. get held accountable. They right. do lock us up. They do give us time that's uh, probably the same crime as a white person, yeah, but we get more time. Yeah. Yeah. So those things are happening. So you, only thing we're saying with Black Lives Matter is we gotta just honor and respect each other. Uh, but it's not hypocritical in a sense, because those that are empowered to carry out a job, they, held they need they held accountable higher to a account, higher yeah. level. Yeah, we paying you. Yeah, <laughs> we're paying they we paying them to protect and serve. Yeah, that's true. You know, I'm not paying Pookie. Yeah, yeah, to protect right. and serve right. me. You make it makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Chris had a question. I have two questions that were texted in. The first one says, "How can a conservative white guy support the black community when they disagree with far left policies that the Black Lives Matter organization has on their website?" Ooh. Can I address that one? Yeah. I, I'm just going to address this because I don't know if people look into the Black Lives Matter website, but they, they would probably be totally against uh, Christianity. 
when it comes to the Black Lives Matter organization. Yeah. The Black Lives Matter saying is we're, we're saying black people that we matter. Yeah. So, it's a, it's so I, think, they, I yeah. think what happened is that you put their agenda, by naming it what they named it, really is, yeah, I see it's, what it's, it's, it's a mess, really. Yeah, it was, it was, it's, it's, yeah. You're, still in the, you're still in the platform. You must understand the difference between yeah, the, the, yeah, the, the, yeah. the go the, look at the movement and then yeah the movement versus the message. Yeah, and you have to separate the two. There's yeah. the movement of Black Lives Matter. That's the organized organization. Yeah, but then the move the message that wasn't just, created by Black people. Right. What's that? Right. right. Black Lives Matter. Movement. The organization was. Yeah, but but I'm talking. The organization about, was created by three black lesbian women. I'm saying I'm saying the 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 uh, mentality behind. Black Lives Matter? Yes. No, that was created because black guys was getting killed. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not talking about that about? part. Uh, I'm, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, the, he was asking a great question. Uh, how can a conservative white guy participate in helping uh, our society move past institutional racism and not buy into a liberal agenda? Is that what no. the question was? Can you read your question? Somewhat. How can a conservative white guy support the black community when they disagree with far left policies that the Black Lives Matter organization has on their website? Can I, I just want to offer eat, eat the meat and spit out the bones. If there's parts you can't do, let it go. But the meat of it is our brothers and sisters of color have asked for your help. Be the man that God made you to be. Stand up and say, I may not agree with all of this, but what happened to George Floyd is not in my name. I am my brother's keeper. Friends, my white friends, I'm sorry, I'm going to take this real quick. Go brother Micah. Oh, shoot. Our, our, our brothers and sisters are asking for our help. They don't want to have to go through and keep um, crying. They don't want their kids bleeding in the street. They don't want their daughters going to sleep and being killed like Breonna Taylor was. Would you want your kid in their bed at college, in the military, serving as a, as a paramedic, getting shot in their sleep? So what they're asking for is, is can you stand up and say, whatever that was, it's wrong and it's got to change. That's what you can do. You don't have to embrace a far left agenda to say, I don't want my kid getting killed. Yeah, right? I, I'm sorry. I just, right. It's uh, not rocket science. I mean, yeah. well, I'll get to my thank yous in a minute. I'm going to... Um, just give you my personal convictions on seven lies that our Pledge of Allegiance tells. Whoa. This is my, this is just my personal little mycology. Um, but it says I pledge my one, I talked to one of my um to my one of my deacons, and um, he and I talk all the time, and he shared with me an experience he had when he decided to stop saying the Pledge of Allegiance in school. Mm. And uh, when he got to, to the principal's office, they didn't think it was a big deal. But it's most certainly a big deal now um, why he wouldn't say it. And when, I, when, I, when all this was happening, I, I, I thought about the Colin Kaepernick situation, why we wouldn't bow during the national anthem or, 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 or salute the national anthem or, or people disrespecting the flag. And I've heard people say it's not about the flag. And I'm going to tell you why I think it is. Because our Pledge of Allegiance, in my opinion, tells us seven lies. Let me give you the, the seven lies. Our Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United stop lie number one, United States of America, we're not united. We're the most divided states we've ever seen. Uh, I pledge of allegiance, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, lie number two. One nation, lie number three, under God, oh my God, lie number five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, keep going. Indivisible, lie number five, with liberty, lie number six, and justice for all. There is no way you can watch the news for any amount of time and think that our Pledge of Allegiance is accurate. And maybe the four of us on this panel didn't, don't have it all figured out. Maybe we didn't say everything you thought needed to be said. We did not come up here to think that we could cure racism in an hour. But I, what I do know, what all four of us agree on, is that there is a problem. It's a big problem. It's a big problem. And the solution to that problem is not began with uh, us fighting. 
but it begins with us, somebody saying, we got a problem and it's time to fix it. And it, it begins with us. The people that are in government that are in positions to make changes, they are there because we put them there. Our tax dollars purchase us police officers. Our votes, or lack thereof, puts people in office to make the changes that we want to make. So if you don't like the government that you are under, then change the government that you're under. If you want to be, if you want to change the world, get educated so you can change the world. Listen, my name is Pastor Micah D. Johnson. I'm better known as Pastor Jay, senior pastor right here at the Bread House. I hope you have thoroughly enjoyed this second edition of The Pastor's Perspective. Let me first thank my panel for coming out. Uh, Y'all helped me celebrate all online for uh, Councilman Cedric Dean, my boy. Amen, my dude. Uh, also, Pastor Chris Yost, amen, H celebrate him, amen, and my pastor, my pastor, Pastor T.L. Mitchell. I need some amen. gas money. <laughs> I'm going to make sure you get it, too. <laughs> uh, uh, gentlemen, can y'all tell me what organizations y'all work, you know, I know y'all rep your churches and organizations. Show, tell, tell the people, our listening audience, how they can support your ministry or your organizations. Say, right. we'll start with you. Uh, we're putting together an organization called the Organization of Black American Unity, and uh, what we're going to be doing is carrying out the aims and objectives of Malcolm X organization, organization of Afro-American unity. So we're basically going to be carrying out those 10 aims and objectives, um, and we're going to be doing those here in Hunt County, and uh, hopefully they'll spread out uh, everywhere else. But we'll start here where we live, Hunt County, and uh, that's what we're going to be doing. So we bringing back uh, something, an uh, organization, bringing back the spirit of somebody who I feel can bring us some tangible changes sure. uh, here in the United States, especially here in Hunt County. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. yeah uh, first of all, I didn't say at the beginning, I love my wife, Melissa. Thanks for do letting me do all this fun <laughs> stuff. I got three great kids too. But, uh, um, you know, I love being at Wesley United Methodist Church. It's an intentionally diverse community ideologically, but we're not very ethnically diverse like a lot of churches. Um, and, and, you know, I've got some folks that are watching tonight that agree with me and disagree with me, but we're moving forward together. The other thing I want to offer to you is we're working on the Equal Justice Initiative, and we're trying to raise awareness for Tad Smith, who was uh, lynched down here on the courthouse square. We want to honor that. In oh, Greenville? In 1908. Oh, yeah. I thought something like last no, week. Or no, oh, no, no. Okay, all right. Back so, in man, 1908. I'll be on my way back to Dallas if that happens. All right, okay, all right. <laughs> With the, the Corporation for Cultural <laughs> Diversity is working on that. We also had uh, 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 Mr. Pretty, who was lynched here in Hunt County. There were three lynchings. My goodness. And uh, uh, we're trying to go through and bring justice to their blood, which is cried out to God from the soil. Mm. You know, and we are our brother's keepers. So, uh, anyway. Thank you for letting me be yeah. here. All, there's a lot of folks that are behind the scenes. Those of you who are at home know that we're up here, but we aren't up here if they aren't out there. Right. So a big hand to, to all the great folks making it I'm happen. I was going to do that. I, I ain't forgot about y'all. It's on my list. It's right there. So all right. Media. Oh, I didn't mean to take any thunder. I just I know what y'all are doing. I'm grateful. The so. other, another pastor came and think that's you. He's here. That man, man, he he was get, white. And he was white. And I'll never get asked back. Man, you finna get me fired around here, man. I'm about to go to your church and be the youth pastor or something. Oh. <laughs> more money, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you need on, one? I'm, I'm putting it out. Oh. Thanks for having me, for yes, real. Sir. Yes, sir. Brother Mike, I, yeah. I appreciate it. Right. Right. You right. know. Yeah, I want to say thank you, uh, Pastor Johnson, for allowing me to uh, be here. Um, we're a Bonaire church family. Uh, Baptist is our doctrine, uh, but we're more inclusive. We're just having just church family. And uh, we're in Highland Hills. It's a community in Dallas. We're praying still for Highland Hills. And so we want to change our, uh, our neighborhood first, and then we're going to take it to the world. So we're starting right in Highland Hills. We're trying to do uh, some reformation with the policing in Highland Hills, the crime in Highland Hills, and stores and economic development right in Highland Hills. That's my, that's my goal. Thank you all so much, brothers. Thank you all. And listen, uh, I think uh, you can uh, contact uh, Cedric. Uh, to to if you can't be at his um, in his organization, you can definitely sew into it. Uh, you can uh, contact him, and he'll if you want to give a donation. Sometimes you just can't do something, but you can send something, and so that's that's a great opportunity. To I go gotta drive well. back to Dallas. Y'all can cash out me. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, uh, my home church, Bonaire Baptist Church, is, uh, Bonaire Church Family is on Givelify. So if you want to give and sow to them, just look look up Bonaire Church Family on Givelify. I thought Didi was bad. You got man, she, man, listen, got he fruit. petty, man. And uh, I believe uh, Pastor, Pastor Joe says, is uh, Wesley on Givelify as well? I'm sorry. Say Are they on give, y'all do electronic giving? Yes, yes. We, uh, yeah, at uh, WesleyUMCGreenville.org. Okay. Click donate now. You can scroll down and on follow the prompts. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, or I don't know. I okay. don't handle. Yeah. So in the Methodist church, preachers don't touch the money. Somebody else does all no, that. No, we don't do it here either. Okay, good, good. But I, I don't right. know. I really yeah. don't know. I don't so. get to either. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, um, I want to also thank our listening audience, those of you watching online, uh, uh, watching online and all that good stuff. Fed Media, thank y'all so much. Fed Media, thank y'all so much. It's our media ministry. Uh, they help well, also my personal ministry, Micah D. Johnson Ministries. Uh, thank you to my minister of music. We're going to get him saved one day, uh, but he helped us today, Richard Blue. And to all of you who are here, uh, thank y'all so much. And uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Uh, we know, that, Lord, that this world was formed because of a conversation. You spoke it into existence. And but we also know, Lord, that sin began with a conversation between, between a serpent and a human. And so we know that lives and can be changed and worlds can be molded that because words shape worlds. And so we had this conversation because we're trying to shape a new world where, uh, where, where everyone can be cr- treated equally and We envision a day, as Dr. King said, where we will not be judged by the color of our skin, by the content of our character. May the grace of God, the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with us both now and forevermore until we all meet again. In Jesus, to Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Love y'all.